today we are going to move into unsupervised learning and the first topic of unsupervised learning is going to be clustering. This is lecture seven demo meaning the, the notebook for Wednesday's class. I just didn't have time. So um, the first part is some plots that we've seen before. What do decision trees look like in two dimensions? with two classes. Uh, we've looked at K and N already with various values of K. Um, and I just wanted to show you random forests as well. So each, uh, each tree is a deep decision tree. And this is just an estimator is equals one. So this is just one tree. Um, which has split on the same feature every time. And then you can have five trees and things start to get a little crazier. So this already doesn't really look like what you would expect from a decision tree. Um, I won't put myself on the spot and try to answer whether it would be possible to get this. Probably. Uh, but it doesn't look like what we expect to see with decision trees. And then as you get to 50 trees, um, things get even crazier looking. But supposedly, this is supposed to overfit less um, since we're averaging a bunch of trees. The whole fact that we're picking random features, well, there's only two features here, so it's not quite as interesting. Uh, I can't even be certain that it's restricting itself at all. Maybe it is to one. But just wanted to show you this picture of random forests. And then we also talked about ensembling more generally, not just about random forests. Random forest was one thing we talked about. Um, so I loaded this news groups data set that's built into scikit-learn. Well, some of the tiny data sets are really built into scikit-learn, which means they're just there and you can load them. This one, it's not already there, but you can call a function and it'll automatically download the data set. So if you run this, it takes a few minutes to download the data set. And um, I guess it's your assignment one or assignment two or both has a similar but much smaller data set of these uh, news groups. I think it's just assignment two, the one that was posted yesterday. So you have documents, you generate some features from bag of words or something similar, and you try to classify what type of uh, document they are or the group. So we can load this big data set, and we can see it has a huge amount of features. In fact, more features than examples in this case because there's just a lot of words um, that are being considered and 20 different categories. And I just, I didn't try to tune these in any way. I just trained a decision tree and it overfit like crazy, got pretty much zero training error and not very impressive validation error um, of 44% error. It's still better than random. Well, um, with ran since there are 20 classes, depending on the distribution, um, you might get something like 1 in 20 correct. And then I trained a random forest. In this case, it was pretty disappointing. Not even that much better than uh, the decision tree. But I haven't tuned the hyperparameters. I've just used all the defaults here. I did KNN, it was pretty slow. Um, Random Forest was relatively slow as well to train, not fast enough to do it live. Um, and then I also ensembled these things uh, with the voting classifier. So voting basically meaning what we were calling averaging last class. So scikit-learn so has this voting classifier, and you can just pass in other classifiers. Um, in this case, the results were still pretty bad. Uh, it's hard to say what bad is in the sense that, well, maybe you're happy with 40% because it's much better than random. But I say bad in the sense that it's hardly better than the best 
of those three models. I think the random forest was also, OK, well, we, I guess we went from 43 to 41. So at least I'm showing the concept that um, the average can be better than the best one. So well, maybe that's actually a bit compelling in the sense that you start with the random forest and take two significantly worse things, add them to the random forest, and you actually do better. So in that sense, it's nice. Um, and then I also have, and this is not something we cover in the course, uh, XG boost. So I mentioned boosting very briefly, but I said we weren't going to go into it. And then gradient boosting is a variant of the classic boosting. And this XG boost is a popular library that does gradient boosted trees. So if you want to run this, you have to install some extra stuff. It's also a little bit slow, uh, but without particularly any tuning, I more or less copy and pasting from the, the example, um, I was able to get better results. Um, oops. If you were wondering why it wasn't overfitting at all, it's because I was printing the uh, test error twice. Ooh, OK. Luckily, I had already trained it. Um, otherwise, it would take a few minutes. But luckily, I trained it and kept the notebook open. OK, in any case, um, this that makes more sense. So this model is still overfitting, but getting much better validation error than the other one. So just in case you're curious. <coughs> Any thoughts before we jump into clustering? And I'll, uh, I'll fix this bug online as well. OK. So today we're going to talk about clustering. There's many reasons why you might want to cluster points. Um, but for example, you might have some feature vectors for a bunch of different types of cancer cells, like gene expression data. And you might say, well, are there, can I classify this into different types of cancer? So we're in the world of unsupervised learning here, which means there's no y. We just have x. Um, and that's very different from what we were doing before, which was all about prediction. Try to produce y. Try to get a good score. So we talked about this. We talked about this. Um, and unsupervised learning, the goal is often a little bit more vague than supervised learning. And it's sometimes also harder to measure how well you're doing. In supervised learning, trying to get this, did I do a good job of getting it or not? Here it's like, hey, here's my data set. Are there interesting trends that I should know about? Right? Well, that's kind of an extreme case in terms of vagueness. But um, the, the task is sometimes less specified. So clustering would be a little more specified. Hey, can you find groupings in the data? But it's still not that obvious uh, if one grouping is better than another. So things that you can do with unsupervised learning, and we will talk about almost all of these in this course. Um, outlier detection, similarities, product recommendations, um, latent factors, turning. <laughs> breaking things down into parts, uh, which we'll, we'll get to later in the course. Uh, visualizing high dimensional data. We won't talk about ranking um, this term. And clustering is another one. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do with unsupervised learning. And they may arise in different situations. OK. What is clustering? Basically, we have n objects, and we want to group them. These ones are grouped. These ones are grouped. These ones are grouped. Um, and we had the, the cancer example, but there's a whole bunch of um, situations where you might want to do this. <coughs> 
However, as I, as I keep saying, we don't have the correct groups to compare with. So that's going to be a challenge. Um, and so we, we had been doing that spam, uh, spam example. So you might have different clusters of, of spam emails. Um, I should say that the clustering we're going to talk about today would not actually give us these names. It will just give us the grouping. So these types of emails are together, these types of emails. And often a human then has to go back and look at the group and think about it and give it a name that makes sense to other people. OK. Um, So I have this example here, but um, so I have this example here in 2D. Uh, we have a bunch of points in 2D, and we're using the colors to indicate which cluster we're in. So the color would be the output of our unsupervised learning algorithm, and just the unlabeled points would be the input. Um, so the input would look sort of like this, the x, and the output would look sort of like this y, just labeling each point. <coughs> okay. Um, yeah. What's your name again? Masood. Masood. Yeah. Uh, but if you go back to the previous slide. I, I have a question. Yeah. So here, for example, we have two, three, one. And what do you mean by two, three, one? You're, these are just, you're just. Uh, what do I mean by two, three, and one? So these are just arbitrary labels. The whole two is, say, blue, and three is purple or whatever. They're just arbitrary labels so that if this point is in group two and this point is in group two, we can say they're in the same group. But we'll talk more about this today. We, the labels themselves don't mean anything. OK, so roughly, intuitively, if we're clustering things, then points or objects in the same cluster should be similar, and objects in different clusters should be different. Um, and that evokes this idea of distance between points, which we'll be talking more about today. Uh, but yes, again, it's hard to define what's best. OK. Um, so clustering is now within the umbrella of unsupervised learning. And even within the umbrella of clustering, there's several reasons why you might want to do it. So you might just have some objects, and you want to know what are the different types. Um, or you may want, so this prototype idea we'll also talk about, you may want a representative example for different groups. You may want to define groups in advance so that when you have a new point later, you can say what group it's in. This would be kind of the prediction in terms of clustering, uh, et cetera. So a whole bunch of things you can cluster. Um, I like the pasta sauce example. Uh, I think I read about it in some pop psychology book or, or something. But uh, people studied this very carefully to come up with the three or however many types of pasta sauce they wanted to sell. And you have all kinds of different people. And everyone's going to like something slightly different. But you cannot sell 500 different types uh, of, of whatever your product is. So maybe you just want to know what are the main groups and try to pick a compromise so that within each group, people will be relatively satisfied. So you'll assume people will buy the one that they like best. And you want that to be kind of representative for that group so that they'll be relatively happy. OK. <coughs> so that is the goal. The goal is clustering. And now we're going to start talking about some algorithms for doing this automatically. Any questions, though, on the goal of what we're trying to do? Kyle? Kyle, Kyle yeah, OK. We take a supervised thing. So we have an x and a y, and pull that x 
uh, let's look for the y into the x data set. Can we then run unsupervised stuff against it? OK, Kyle is asking um, if we do have x and y, can we treat y as just another column of x and then do unsupervised learning? Um, yeah, so we can do that. There is a bit of the blurring between unsupervised and supervised in the sense that, yes, the thing you're trying to predict is just another measurement uh, for each object. But what's special about it is that usually when you deploy the system, that's the one thing that you don't have. You have it in your training set, but that's what you're not going to have. Um, and you want to figure it out. But yes, there is some blurring between the two. Maybe you just have a bunch of data and you don't know which is kind of the important thing and you're just looking for relationships and then you discover automatically that with these things I can predict this other thing and that's interesting stuff like that. <coughs> okay. So we are trying to do clustering and the classic clustering algorithm is called k-means and so we'll first talk about k-means today. And then we'll talk about a non-parametric clustering algorithm after that. So the main hyperparameter with k-means is k. And uh, it happens a lot. It, it happens to me, too. Um, but it happens a lot to students in this course that people mix up k-means and k-n-n just because they're both k something, I guess. But there, there are actually also some other similarities in that they're both going to involve distances between examples. Um, so try to avoid that, especially on an exam or something. Just do a double mental check that you're thinking about the right one. Um, they're very different, in fact, because one is supervised learning method and one is an unsupervised learning method. OK. So we have this hyperparameter k, and the other thing we're going to need to um, input here is an initial guess for each of our cluster centers. So we can already see some weaknesses before we even talk about how this works in the sense that you might not know how many groups there are, and yet I'm telling you, you have to specify that in advance, k, before you even start. Uh, and the other method we'll talk about today doesn't have this re restriction. OK, so here's how it's going to work. And I'm going to show this to you visually in a minute. But we're going to be alternating between two steps, which is assigning each point to the closest center and then readjusting the center. So let's, let's go to the notebook, and then we can revisit that. Uh, good. Is the font size OK in the back? Yeah? OK. Um, A little bigger if you can. All right. OK, so <coughs> I'm just going to generate some very obviously clusterable uh, synthetic data so that we can <coughs> see relatively clearly what it should be doing, which isn't always the case. But just for the moment, that'll help us walk through it. So I'm generating these four clusters, basically, in, in two dimensions. And so what I mentioned before is that we need to randomly initialize the mean. So we're just going to pick four points at random and say those are our four clusters. OK. So there should be four triangles that you can hopefully see. The purple one's a little bit hard to see because it's on top of a bunch of uh, black points. But we have these four. Uh, cluster means. And these are supposed to represent where the clusters are. And we just pick them randomly at the beginning, so they're not particularly good in any way. We just had to start somewhere. So we start somewhere, and then we iteratively improve. And so what we're going to do here is assign that the points aren't colored yet. But what we're going to do is for each point, we're going to say, 
which is the closest cluster center to me? So I'm going to compute for each point four distances. From that point to the four cluster centers. And I'm going to take the smallest one and you can see it's sort of like K and N, right? Computing distances, looking at which ones are small. Um, and I'm going to assign myself to that cluster, which basically means paint myself the color of that cluster. Again, color is just for visualization, uh, but we'll have an integer label for each cluster. Okay, so maybe stare at this for a minute and just convince yourself that the color of each point corresponds to the closest cluster center. Yeah, very good. Uh, is there a reason why uh, the cluster at the top corner doesn't have a center? Is there a reason why the cluster at the top corner doesn't have a center? Well, we want there to be because to us it's obvious that that's the right answer. But we just randomly initialize the algorithm. So we hope it's going to get there, but we haven't done much work yet. We've just, so far we just picked them randomly. It would be nice if that happened by itself, which it, which it will. Yeah. Um, so by the way, I'm using the variables Z and uh, W. So I'm using W to store the cluster centers, meaning the size of W must be K by D. Each point in this space is a D dimensional point, and we just have K of them living in the rows of W. And I'm using Z as a vector of length n, one per point. There's just an integer sitting in there to store um, the labels. <coughs> OK, so I told you how to update Z, which is assign each point to the closest mean. And now we need to update the means. Yeah, what's your name? Karinder. Karinder, right. Um, so just quickly backtracking a little bit. Uh -huh. Is there the means selection isn't random. It's based on the plots that are. Uh, I initialize the means by picking four random points and just sticking them on top of those four points. Just luck out on the fact that it's pretty close to where. Um, did we just luck out? Yeah, I mean, we weren't that lucky. I mean, really lucky would have been one per region, but um, well, they have to. I mean, it couldn't be that much worse than this. I guess you could have all four of them in the same place, but that would be pretty unlikely, or three and one. But I think this is a typical arrangement. This is a much cleaner situation than you would normally deal with in that the clusters are well separated and we're only in two dimensions. But other than that, sure. OK, so we updated Z by painting each point the color of the closest cluster center. And now we're going to update W by setting the new location to the average of the points of that color. So I'm going to take all the green stuff, average them, and that's going to be the new location of the green triangle. It's not going to move that much. But I'm going to take all the yellow stuff, average them. The yellow triangle is going to move up and left. There's going to be a pull from those yellow points. And so I can run this. And this is exactly what happened. So I've recomputed the cluster centers to be the average location or center of mass, if that's helpful, of the points of that color. And now the assignments aren't correct anymore. It is no longer necessarily true that every point is properly colored because they were properly colored, but then we moved the means. We changed the rules, right? So now those points up and left, well, it's a bit hard to see, but maybe more of them are going to turn yellow because we've moved the yellow center. So we kind of do the right thing. We color the points in the right way, and then we mess it all up by changing the means according to those, and then we color the points again, and then we mess it up again. Ian. And you just repeat them. <coughs> That's exactly k-means, yes. So k-means is what we just did repeated until convergence. And one way we can con define convergence is that nothing's changing anymore. Yeah. OK, so <coughs> indeed. <coughs> Even if you aren't following all the code, um, this code should be relatively reasonable. I'm just looping 100 times and alternating those two steps. 
updating Z, updating W, and then I'm just plotting it at the end. So here things worked out. I eventually converged to the right thing. And you can go home, open this, run it, go through it step by step, and see how it evolves. Um, but we eventually got something reasonable here, which doesn't always happen. And we'll talk about that. Um, and I didn't use the proper convergence uh, criterion. I just wanted the code to be as simple as possible. So I just did it 100 times, which I assumed would probably be good enough for this simple situation. Fred. Um, what do you do that gets, smile. OK. <laughs> what do you do when it gets stuck in local minima? What do you do when it gets stuck in, in local minima? So right. We'll, we'll talk about that. One problem is it doesn't always converge to something that you would be happy with. OK, so first I'll just print out w. So you can see, like I promised, it's a k by d um, array. In this case, four means each in two dimensions. I just print out z so you can see that it looks the way I promised, which is a whole bunch of integers labeling the four clusters. 0 through 3. Um, and another thing I want to do is I'm just going to run scikit-learns k-means. Um, and OK, it works. Good. We kind of expect it to also work. <coughs> but um, note the colors here. So blue, green, purple, yellow. But when we did it our way, we got the same results, but the colors were different. Um, and this brings up something we just talked about that uh, Masood was asking about, that the labels are completely arbitrary. So I, I can't say we're right and this one's wrong or vice versa, because it doesn't mean anything that this is cluster 1 and this is cluster 3. It's, it only means something that these points are together and these points are together. And we, we need some way of keeping track, so a convenient way is some label for each group, but beyond that, we shouldn't be reading into it. Connor. Um, how does this work, or does it work with discrete data? How does this work with discrete data? So like right now, we're doing two continuous variables. How would it work with this? Uh, one so, so Connor is asking if the features are discrete. Um, so what we really need to be able to do is compute distances. So roughly you can come up with a distance that makes sense for the data type that you have. And maybe maybe it's something, t a totally different data type, like, I don't know, graphs, social networks, I, I, I don't know, um, music. But if you can define distances, you can do this. Um, the other thing you can do is try to convert the data to numerical in the way that we talked about at the beginning of the course, and then just this is using Euclidean distance, by the way. Um, just do something like that. OK, so uh, when I say label switching here, that refers to this issue that the labels are arbitrary. So the labels were switched, but the clusterings were actually the same. OK, so then um, to deal with this issue of local minima, um, I'll just reinitialize it with some other um, initialization. So here's a different initialization. Doesn't look that different from the one we had, but with this initialization, um, I actually converge. And I, I guess you might not believe me. I can do more iterations, or I could just code it up properly. But um, it's actually converged to this. And what it means is that in this situation, each point is already assigned to its closest center. And each center is already at the average of those points. So there's no further changes we could make. And yet, we're somehow not satisfied with the results. So this is a way in which k-means is imperfect in that it could converge. It could say, hey, I'm done. but it could converge differently for different initializations, and some may be better than others. And in the, in the assignment, you'll be exploring that and how to pick the better clustering and stuff like that fit. So if you were to, uh, 
have a bunch of random initializations and then you know finding the mean be between the between between all the results mm -hmm. would it you know be the four <laughs> that we want playing right into my plan um, fed asked <laughs> Could we do a bunch of random initializations and then somehow average the clusters? So uh, we'll, we'll, we will talk about that today. And you have to be very careful because it can go, can go wrong. Um, OK. Um, by the way, the reason I knew the thing would succeed the first time and not succeed the second time is just that I set the seed for the random or pseudo random number generator just so I know it would work but if I deleted this um, it would just be different every time so this time it looks okay I don't know how many times I'd have to do it oh this time it didn't okay so not that bad um, but I just like to have the seed in there for extra comfort okay so the next part of the demo we will leave for a bit later. Let's jump back to the slides. OK, so this should now make sense to you, these steps. Assign the points, update the means, assign the points, update the means, mm -hmm. until convergence. Marion. How can we uh, evaluate the uh, number of clusters? Yeah, how can we evaluate the number of clusters? So we'll, we'll get to that. And it's also on the assignment. Yeah. OK, so um, k means when you use Euclidean distance is guaranteed to converge. But as we saw, that isn't necessarily that great. I mean, it's better maybe than not converging. But if it converges to a solution that is really bad, then we're still not very happy. Um, In terms of, I mentioned prediction before. So if you do, if you have a bunch of points, let's say you run k-means, you find the three best pasta sauces, then a new person comes along, they want to buy pasta sauce. You already made all the sauces, so you're not going to change the clustering. You're not going to move the means when you got that new person, but you still want to assign them to a cluster, meaning you still want to tell them which sauce to buy for their pasta. You just compute the closest one. Uh, and that's what this means by predicting for a new point. It's just that in some cases, you may not want to redo everything when the new example comes along, or new whever it is, object. OK. Um, yeah, so how do you pick k? Um, there are ways to pick k, and you will explore one on the assignment. Um, but. I guess there's a whole Wikipedia article on how to do this. And by the end, you're still not very happy. So um, that is a complicated question. And there are fancier methods that address it in maybe a more principled way. Um, there are also kind of medium fancy methods, like the one we'll talk, to, talk about if we have time, which is looking less and less likely. So let's continue. <laughs> Um, right, and each object is assigned to only one cluster, so that's another sort of limitation. And there's other types of clustering where each point has some amount of membership in all of the groups, which is maybe more realistic in some situations. And we talked about this. Uh, someone suggested that. And if we want to rerun, reinitialize the thing a bunch of times and pick the best, then we just have to decide um, how do we give a score for each one so that we can pick. Well, Fed was suggesting averaging, which we'll get to. But if you just want to pick the best, we need some sort of score. Um, and a very common score is the sum of the distances from each point to its own cluster mean. So if many points are super far away from their cluster means, then that's not good. Uh, but if all the points are really close to their cluster means, then that is good. And when we saw in the visualization, the cluster mean was kind of halfway between two islands. That means you're going to have these big distances, and it'll have a worse score than the proper result. OK. See bonus slides. Um, Right, so there's some better ways to initialize that also 
improves the situation, and the scikit-learn one uses this k-means plus plus initializer by default. Ali. Uh, is variance of clusters a, like a factor here at all? So let's say you have two clusters. One is like really dense, another one is like spread out. And even if a new point is closer to the dense one, it's more likely that it's part of the, the bigger mm -hmm. one. Right, OK. So Ali is saying that um, we can't have clusters of different sizes or different densities. So um, we may have a really small cluster over here and a big cluster over there. And we might have a point in the middle that's a bit closer to the small cluster, but we'd actually rather assign it to the big cluster. So um, that is a limitation of k-means. There are clustering methods that deal with that. Um, we will talk about it on Monday to some extent. Um, but there are also all kinds of, for example, probabilistic methods. Uh, fitting probability distributions where you can separately fit a variance for each one, for example, and learn that automatically. Uh, but we won't talk about that in, in this class. Yeah. OK. Um, this thing is the thing I just talked about. The sum of distances for each point to its cluster mean. We're getting into some pretty gnarly notation here, w sub y hat sub i. Um, let's see. W is a matrix containing the cluster means. Y hat is, I was calling it z in the notebook, sorry. Here it's y. So y is the label that I'm picking for a given point. So if point 98 has labeled cluster 2, then yi is going to be 2, and then w2 is the corresponding mean. So this w sub y sub i is the, vec the mean vector for the cluster that I think I'm in for point i. Um, so it's, it's easier in, in words, I guess, than in equations. But now I'm just summing this for all points. So it's, as I said before, the sum of distances from each point to its cluster mean. Uh, Kyle. Does this have any relationship with these squares? Does this have any relationship with least squares? Um, well, we are taking the least of something that, yeah, I mean, yes. Um, yes and no. I mean, uh, OK, well, we, we can talk more about those, those ties in, in a few weeks. Um, but when we talk about PCA. But at, at the moment, personally, I don't find it a helpful connection, at least yet. But if you do, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are there are there are ties. Okay. Um, yeah, we can move on from this. Okay. So, how much does this cost in terms of computational time? Um, we have, like k and n, we have all these distances to compute. So at each iteration, we have to compute the distance from each point to its cluster mean. And each distance computation is basically subtracting two vectors of length d and squaring them. So that's an O of d operation. And then how many distances do we need to compute? We have n points, k means. And so we have n k distances and d points. Um, so this is this calculations are somewhat related to the calculations we did for k and n. Uh, so that's the cost of doing the assignment step, and then the updating of the means. Well, we're just taking subsets of the points and averaging their their locations. By the end, we've looked at all the points, which is n. Um, and we have d coordinates, so this is the this step is faster than the other step. Okay, we've talked about that. Um, there's a bunch of bonus slides about this vector quantization issue. Um, it's kind of related to the pasta sauce example I was. It's basically saying for each point, quantize it, meaning approximate it to some prototype. So for each person, I'm going to approximate them as this other type of person that corresponds to a particular 
sauce because I can't have a million different types of sauce. So the last question on assignment two is all about this, and you'll be using it to make a very rudimentary image compression algorithm. OK. Um, so Ali was sort of getting at this issue that um, how are we partitioning the space? So just like we made those colored pictures with supervised learning where we had the red shading and the blue shading saying, what am I going to predict? We can make these kinds of pictures for clustering and say at each point, what cluster am I going to be put into, which is the same as saying, what am I going to predict? Um, and so we get these specific types of shapes with k-means because we're just taking the, the closest point at uh, the closest mean. And in particular, the word for this is that we get these convex regions. So we're not going to go into this too much at the moment, um, but just to point it out as a limitation of k-means in the sense that you might want other types of partitioning of the space. Oh boy, OK. Um, Fed and then two others whose names I will learn. What, what's the name of these cells? They, don't they have a name? Um, I think it's a Voronoi diagram. Does anyone know the name of the cells? Voronoi. Yeah, sounds plausible. Yeah, OK. What's your name? Uh, yeah, I was just asking about Voronoi diagram. OK. Uh, Sultan. Uh, well, what's your name anyway? Uh, Sultan. Sultan. OK. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Liam, OK. How does it work if there are nested clusters? Well, that's just not supported by k-means. So on Monday, we're going to talk about hierarchical clustering, which is precisely <laughs> nesting clusters. Yeah. OK, uh, we don't have time really to talk about convexity, so I'm going to move on. Uh, yeah, don't have time. OK. So the next method I wanted to talk about is density-based clustering. This is definitely going to bleed over into Monday's class, but we can start this today. Uh, and density-based clustering is going to solve some of the issues that have been bothering you guys, like the shapes of the clusters, but uh, will not solve the issue of, say, nested clusters, but we'll, we'll get to that later as well. So uh, let me, I, I, I prefer to go to the notebook first and then chat after, so let's do that. OK, what I'm going to do here is create a different synthetic toy data set, again in 2D, so we can look at it. But I'm intentionally going to generate it in an obnoxious way. I bet no one can picture what it's going to look like just from that. I certainly couldn't. Um, OK, here's my obnoxious data set. So visually, there's kind of a couple things going on. There's this curve over here and the other curve over there. And maybe those things are, should be clusters because they're all kind of connected. Um, but this is exactly this issue of non-convex. And so let's look at what happens if we run k-means on this. OK, here's k-means with k equals 2. So we just have two points, and then our prediction is, what is the closest mean? So in terms of that partitioning diagram, we're just cutting the space like that. Um, and we're not getting what we want, right? And we can't do much about this. So the best I can do about this with k means is I could try increasing k. Because for k equals 2, this is going to be the best clustering. So that was with two clusters. Um, I can increase to 10 clusters. And I'll get something like this, which 
I don't know if you think it's better or worse. I mean, it's better in the sense that I'm not grouping anything from the top curve together with anything from the bottom, bottom curve, but it's also worse in the sense that I'm over partitioning. Um, so I'm taking one group and I'm over partitioning it into five groups. Um, I think Python starts to reuse colors after a certain number of colors. So even if two of those colors are the same, every triangle is its own cluster. OK. Um, so I'm going to run this DB scan on it. And, uh oh. <laughs> Why does this always happen? Let me regenerate the data set. Uh, now I probably have to fiddle with the parameters, which is going to be a total disaster. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> with the right choice of hyperparameters, um, this DB scan thing, at least I'm showing you that it's capable of non-convex clusters, which is really what I wanted to say. Um, I, I wanted to actually say much more, but I'm out of time. So um, only two minutes left. So the next thing we want to talk about is what is this DB scan? How does it work? How does it find non-convex clusters? Very roughly, it um, starts with some seeds and keeps growing the cluster by adding things that are nearby. And it doesn't care what direction. So it can start there and just keep growing to nearby stuff. Um, but it's not going to jump across the, the kind of gap between those two clusters. And so we don't end up joining them. But as always, the choice of hyperparameters is very important here. The question is basically, how big is the gap between the two clusters? And if you have gaps within the cluster that are bigger than that, then you don't really have hope, because that hyperparameter is kind of the gap size that you're willing to traverse while staying in a cluster. 